Blathering, the action of talking long-windedly without making very much sense. I represent that. Today, we'll talk about some advanced branch prediction techniques. I guess most of what we've been talking about is probably in like chapter four, I think. You don't have to read it. Recommended though. Mainly we covered chapters one through four. We'll talk a little bit about chapter nine here. Mispredicted branches are really, really bad, and therefore branch prediction performance is really, really important. That's because when you mispredict the branch, you have to squash a bunch of instructions. And as you make your pipeline deeper and wider, you have more instructions you squash and therefore a bigger penalty every time you make a bad prediction. A lot of work in the 90s and early 2000s and even still today on doing better branch prediction, predicted execution, really, I call it speculative. You speculate what the right thing should be. Global branch history schemes are interesting because it is speculated. See what I did there? that the Intel processors use a global but hybrid scheme for branch prediction. I don't think anyone knows outside of Intel exactly what they do. G-Share is thought to be the most similar to what Intel uses. We want to keep our front end of our processor full. We want to keep fetching and decoding instructions. When we hit a branch point in a program, meaning the control flow of the program can go one out of several places, we want to start fetching instructions from where the control flow is going to go, but we don't know where that is yet. Branch prediction is the most common technique for speculation. There are other kinds of control flow predictions that are made in processors, not just conditional branches. Jumps are predicted, so predicting the Address of a jump target is a kind of speculation. The same is true for function calls and function returns. So when a call instruction is fetched, predicting that you are fetching a call instruction and what destination that call instruction is going to call is also a speculation. The only information typically available in the fetch stage of the processor is the program counter from which you are fetching. Whence, from which, whence, I should say whence, it's cooler, it's a cooler word. All right, so the program counter tells you where to fetch from. We use the program counter to index into hardware structures that are used to make predictions. And this is all done in the fetch stage. Sometimes those structures are direct mapped. That's been all the examples that I've used so far is to talk about direct mapped branch history table and direct mapped branch target buffer. However, just like with cache, you can also use associative searches in those structures. You can have a, a set associative branch history table, for example. These prediction structures are searched, they're indexed and searched in the fetch stage based on the program counter. And their predictions are used for the next fetch stage in pipelines deeper than five stages Typically, it requires several stages before we can actually validate, verify the prediction, whether we made the prediction correctly, which may entail multiple predictions in the same cycle. For conditional branches, we predict both the target and the outcome, two predictions, although they're related to each other. We generally can't confirm the target until we finish the branch target calculation. In a MIPS processor, that can happen in the decode stage. And we can't confirm the branch outcome until after we do the evaluation of the branch condition. It may take some time. And in that time, we're fetching more and more instructions. And if we made a wrong prediction, we have to go back and we have to undo our speculation. When we execute the branches or when we confirm the predictions, that's also when we will update those prediction tables. To update the state of the branch history 
table after we know the outcome of the branch. So there's a delay between when you use a prediction and when you confirm it and update the state of the hardware tables that are used for making predictions. In a superscalar processor, the reorder buffer, ROB, is responsible for keeping track of which instructions are speculative and which are not speculative. This can be done in many different ways. The two most common ways are to append a single speculative bit to every entry in the reorder buffer. Another method is to search the reorder buffer for branches for instructions that cause speculation. Either approach is feasible. You can also also support speculation without the reorder buffer, but then you need to have register rename files that support undoing their operations. The future file or the rename register remap table needs to be able to be unwound, discard, transient remap register results. And you can speculate through multiple branches at a time. When you predict one branch in this example is taken, you could predict another branch is not taken and then find out later that it was taken. And so maybe one prediction is right, but one prediction is wrong. In the reorder buffer, there's two general approaches to dealing with that as well. You can allow the branch to reach the head of the reorder buffer, and then you can squash the whole reorder buffer and restarting fetch from the right location. This has a steep penalty in some sense, but it's really simple to implement. The other approach is to identify that there was a misspeculated branch somewhere in the reorder buffer and have the ability to flush the remainder of the buffer while you're still finishing and retiring other instructions leading up to the branch. Allocate entries and retire entries from the reorder buffer. After you know the correct outcome, then you have some mechanism to flush, squash the misspeculated instructions from the core of your pipeline, and then to restart fetching from the correct location. But the other issue is that you have speculative instructions that are in flight, modified some of the registers that the core uses. Typical ones we may think of are the reservation stations. So you need a way to squash or invalidate reservation station and being able to invalidate an issue queue or whatever kind of interstage buffers used for queuing between the front end into the out of order core. So just cleaning up all of the state. When you have multiple branches in your reorder buffer, made multiple predictions, you might want to track their speculative effects separately. Say you predict branch A and then you predict branch B. If you determine that you made a misprediction on B, you may want to squash everything after B without modifying stuff between A and B yet. You may not actually have resolved A yet because of out of order in the processor because of data dependencies. So you may allocate different branch tags for instructions based on most recent branch controls their speculative state. So looking at how you kind of hook in this branch prediction structure into a Tomosulo-like architecture. The dispatch buffer is what we've been calling the issue queue. The dispatch logic is what steers instructions out of the issue queue or dispatch buffer into their reservation stations. The branch pipeline there has a update to the branch predictor and the branch predictor is going to control the fetch address. If you have a branch that's predicted taken, then the speculative branch target will be used to fetch instructions from the instruction cache. And we're also going to have the branch outcome used to update the predictor and to detect mispredictions. And then when there's a misprediction, we're going to have to be able to squash what's in red here, registers of the pipeline. If all of that made sense, that's pretty much amazing. If half of it made sense, I think I'm doing my job. If none of it made sense, then you should let me know. I'm not really sure where we restart, but somehow we've misspeculated. Get it? Having a good day today. What can I say? So now you know kind of how branch predictors fit 
into an out of order processor. Previously, we've talked about branch prediction in a pipeline sense. We've talked about the one bit and two bit dynamic branch predictors. We're going to build on that to talk about more advanced branch prediction techniques. So the two level adaptive branch predictor has two to the end tables. We have a global branch history register or branch history table. Our first level is a true branch history table entry, meaning it's tracking the actual branch outcomes. Global means all branches share this branch history register, so we update it on every branch outcome. Local means it acts like kind of the traditional BHT. Branch history registers are in a table and they're indexed by the low order bits of the program counter. This branch history register, and it's a shift register. Every time there's a branch outcome, we shift the register to the left, I don't know, left and right. You can't see it. Everything is backwards. So we shift to the left by one, and then we put the outcome into the least significant bit of the register. So when you read the register from left to right, what you see is the history of the branch from oldest to newest. So in this example, the oldest branches were taken, 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 and then zero indicating that the most recent branch outcome was not taken. We use these branch outcomes, these branch histories, as an index into another table the value of the branch history is used to tell us where in this pattern history table we look for or we find the state of the predictor, the PHT bits, which quite often are just implementing the two-bit predictor we've talked about before. Oftentimes the pattern history table is just an array of two-bit states indexed by the history register. So the first level is that history tracking and the second level is based on the branch behavior indexed by the history. What this does is it allows us to exploit more relationships or correlation between history or outcomes and our state machine based predictors. You can set this up with lots of different parameters. We're going to stick with simple ones. K equals two bits and S equals two bits. That is called a 2-2 adaptive predictor. We use two bits of branch history to index the pattern history tables. That means we only have four pattern history table entries, right? A two bit number is 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then each of those pattern history tables stores a 2-bit state used by a 2-bit state machine. This can achieve really high accuracy because it's using the history of branches to separate branches from each other. Instead of only separating branches based on their program counter addresses, we now also can, for a single branch, correlate its prediction with its most recent behavior. So global schemes use a global register. This is what I was just talking about. That's not too interesting. I mean, all of these are just kind of variations on the same idea. It's just a matter of how you're sort of correlating or tracking branches together. By the way, these are called correlating branch predictors because they correlate branch behavior between different branches or between the same branch with different histories. So in a global branch history register scheme, the global behavior of all branches is used to determine what state you use to make your prediction and what state you update. In the per branch approach, you have a branch history table or a table of branch history shift registers to be precise. That's going to be indexed by the branch address. You may also use some bits of the branch address along with the value in the branch history shift register to determine which state bits you use. Two-dimensional array. I and J here are overlapping. They could be the same, they could be different. And then the G-share predictor 
there's several variations of this, but it uses an arithmetic operator. So you can do addition, you can do XOR. So I think XOR is typically used. You XOR the least significant bits of the branch address with a value of a global branch history shift register. And for whatever reason, this works pretty well. At some point, branch prediction becomes kind of a little bit black magic, a little bit of an art. And so just like any kind of black magic in computing, keep doing stuff and measuring it and see how we do. So we can put together multiple different predictors and then we can use something to select which predictor we use and we can make that kind of black magic key. And ultimately we can just throw machine learning at it to learn correlation between branch outcomes. And that also works pretty well as long as you can implement the machine learning efficiently in the hardware. So that is pretty much a overview of advanced branch prediction and branch prediction in general. Modern hardware, I mean, the, it, it pretty much uses these kinds of approaches, just variations on the same. The important things are concept of speculative execution, what that means, what you have to do when you misspeculate, some notion of more advanced schemes for making predictions beyond the simple one and two bit predictors that are taught at the undergraduate level. This is advanced. This is graduate level stuff.